So what we're going to do, we're going to go back in history, back in time. We're going to pinpoint a time in history and we're going to, by the help of the museum, move through history and see each prophecy being fulfilled. Does that sound exciting? Yeah. Yes. Well, get your Bibles ready. Seat belts. <laughs> and uh, follow me. I've got a few questions to ask you all. What is the title of the talk? Jehovah is a building. It's Jehovah, the God of true promises. Good. Very good. How many prophecies are we looking at? Five. Which Bible book? Isaiah. How many more powers? Three. They are? Yes, Babylon. 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 Very good. Read a Persian. That's the end of your talk, brothers. Thank you. Now we need to go back. We need to pinpoint a time in history to start the talk. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. This is Isaiah accepting his assignment as a prophet. It says, And I began to hear the voice of Jehovah saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I proceeded to say, Here I am, send me. And I proceeded to say, Here I am, send me. Very good. That's Isaiah, he's accepting his assignment as a prophet. Yes, I'll go. Difficult assignment. But so this is the start really of our our pinpoint in history. But the first one says that this happened in the year that King Uzziah died. The insight volumes tell us that King Uzziah died in the year 778 BCE. You got that? Sorry? 778 BCE. So this is the start of our tour really. We're going to move through history and see prophecies being fulfilled. So what was happening with the nation of Israel? How many tribes were there? And they split into two factions. That were ten tribes, the capital in Samaria, towards the north, the two tribes in the capital in Jerusalem. Very good. They're always fighting amongst themselves, weren't they? The ten tribe kingdom had a conspiracy with Syria. Not Assyria, Syria. Against the two tribe kingdom in Jerusalem. The king in Jerusalem was Ahaz. Ahaz? Ahaz. Ahaz. How do you say it in American? Ahaz. Ahaz. Good translation. Thank you. <laughs> what, kind, what sort of a king was Ahaz? Was he a good king or was he a bad king? What do you think? It's a 50 50 question. There's not many of those. There so, good ones. good Oh. Well, he was a bad king. He said good, but he tried. <laughs> now, he was a bad king. In fact, he sacrificed his own sons. Imagine your own offspring sacrificing them to force gods. That's how bad he was. Now, he's got this conspiracy against him, the ten tribes, all the ten tribes, Syria. Who do you think he would turn to for help, being a bad king? Do you think he would turn to Jehovah? No. Not a bad king. No. This was the man he turned to. This menacing monarch, a Syrian, his name is... That's a difficult one, isn't it? In any language. It's Tigla Pileza the third. Now, what are you to say now? Tigla Pileza. I didn't quite hear that. Tigla Pileza the third. Very good. Tigla Pileza the third. I don't know, actually. How you have a spirit? Because this Israelites have become so bad. So bad, Jehovah prophesied that the Assyrians would conquer, would become a world power, a mighty world power, and they would capture all, almost all of the territory of the Israelites. And our first prophecy is Isaiah 8 and verse 7. 
And here, Isaiah describes the Assyrians like a river flooding through, capturing everything. Isaiah 8 and verse 7. So even therefore, look, Jehovah is bringing up against them the mighty and the many waters of the river, the king of Assyria, and all his glory. And he will certainly come up over all his stream beds, and go over all his banks, and move on him through Judah, will actually flood and pass over up to the neck he will reach. So the nation of Israel was going to be up to their neck in trouble <laughs> with the Assyrians. We're going to find out how that was fulfilled. Because Ahaz also turned to Tiglath Pileser, and which the Israelites were trusting in worldly nations. And that was going to be their demise there. Their, their end really. So we're going to have a look in this gallery. Everything in this gallery was taken from Tiglath Pileser's palace. And so we're going to walk around and have a look at the campaign of the Assyrians as they rose. They became the second war power of Bible history, but the first one on this tour. And they, their policy was war. Fighting, warfare, bloodshed. We're going to see um, some of the campaigns. We're going to go into this far corner of here. There's a war going on right now, isn't there, in Iraq? Where you can click the, on the news and see a war correspondent and get the latest updates. You can actually see the action in Iraq. But you can't do that. You couldn't do that back in the time of Isaiah. You'd have to go to a public place like the Palace of the King and they would have carvings on the wall of what was happening. And nothing has changed. Much of it is propaganda to instill fear into enemy nations. And sometimes you see the Warplanes bombarding, don't you, in the news. And that sends out a message, doesn't it, to other nations. Don't mess with our nation, doesn't it? That's the sort of message they like to send out. This war, this battle scene here, you can see these two cavalry men on horseback. Can you see the two soldiers that have just been killed? Where are they? There's one at the front and one at the rear. You see, he's just putting this spear through him, he looks like. What type of bird is this? The Egyptian bird. Ibis? Vulture? 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 Getting closer. Some sort of bird of prey, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Very good. It's not a dove. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> what is it carrying? It's some sort of bird of prey. It's not a vulture. What is it carrying? What is this? Fantastic. Very good. The insides of a soldier. Now, if you turn on the news and you saw American soldiers being eaten by birds, <coughs> that would be on the front page of all the newspapers, would it not? People would be up in arms. They'll have their sons out there being eaten by the birds. So what the Assyrians are saying is, if you come up against us, your men will become food for the birds. So you can see the message they're sending out. But they were a cruel nation. But what about Tiglath Pileser? You can see him here. Can you see him? Can <laughs> you see Tiglath Pileser? He's standing there, upright and proud. Where is his heel resting? Where is his heel resting? On the back of the neck of his enemies. Have you heard that mentioned before in the Bible? Rest your heel on the back of the neck, or your enemies become a footstool. You know that? Yes. A footstool. Yes. In Psalms, Psalms 110 and verse 1, Jesus' enemies will be a footstool. Uh -huh. rest. Uh, yeah. rest. Yes. That terminology is used in the Bible because that's exactly what the kings would do to show that they had dominated or captured their enemies. But it looks like he's going to put the spear through him, doesn't it? So this is Tiglath-Pileser dominating the world, the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. But now, can you see some of the religious symbols around his neck? 
One in particular, you might be familiar with. Can you say this one? What is that? How long before Jesus walked the earth did the Assyrians use the cross as a religious symbol? Very good. Over 700 years ago, they were walking around with crosses around their neck as a religious before symbol. Christ. Before Christ. What does that tell us? It's only been recycled. Recycled. It's the same meat, different gravy. <laughs> That's what we're getting. <laughs> In fact, have you heard of the Victoria Cross? Yeah. The same shape. Awarded to brave soldiers and uh, and to the Assyrians, Tiglath Pileser would award this cross to the soldiers that, that brought back the most enemy heads. They would do a head count. <laughs> And uh, whoever brought the most enemy that they would get one of these crosses. <laughs> they did the same in the wars, the great wars, the first and second world war. They gave soldiers the same cross, same shape, on a medal, on a, on a piece of leather, the same, exactly the same cross. What does that tell you? It's all recycled, isn't it? You can even see the, the president of the moon god sin on the Islamic flag. Have you seen that? And many more, but we haven't got time to go into detail with this. We're going to go into the far corner though. Now, the Assyrians, the Assyrians were experts at ethnic cleansing. You would have heard of that, ethnic cleansing? Yeah? It's a modern term that's been used in the news in the last 10 years or so. They would take a nation, capture a nation, move some here, move some there, move some there. They would disperse them around the world. And that would, so you would end up living in a place surrounded by people of different cultures, religions, languages. In order to weaken nations, that's what they did. And so the Assyrian nation was the strongest and all the others became weak because of that. So each year they would move over 150,000 captives of war around the world. Over 150,000 each year. Ethnic cleansing. All this affected the Israelites. Look at turn to 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29. 2 Kings 15 and verse 29. What does it say? It says, In the days of Pekah the king of Israel, 2 Kings 15 29. What did you say? Whoa. Try again. I don't know how to say it. Not bad. Let's try it again. In the days of Pekah, the king of Israel. Very good. You can speak Assyrian. <laughs> that is the same Tiglath Pileser you see recorded there by the museum. The same Tiglath Pileser posing for that photograph behind you. Wow. Development time was longer than today. The same Tibet Peleza that walked around his palace and looked at the same exhibits that you looked at today is the same Tibet Peleza mentioned in the Bible here. Is that incredible? Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't made up. In fact, it's the first Assyrian king to be mentioned in the Bible. So, you can speak Assyrian now. It says he, the king of Assyria proceeded to take, these are the territory of the Israelites, Aijan, Abel, Bethmarca, Genoa, Kadesh, Hazel, Gilead, Galilee, and all the land of Naphtali, and to carry them into exile in Assyria. So, they flooded through, captured all the towns and cities of the Israelites, in fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. To verify they had that policy, we can see here three Assyrian officials. They're recording the people that they're moving out to different parts of the earth. Can you see the families here? With their belongings in their Volkswagens. <laughs> <laughs> 
They must be German. <laughs> There's the families in their Volkswagens. You can see, even with all cattle, they're moving them out, sending them away to different parts of the earth. This policy affected the Israelites, all in fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah that the Assyrians would flood through and capture everything. But how far would they go? Up to the neck. Up to the neck. So if the Israelites were up to their neck in trouble with the Assyrians, what city would be left? Judah. Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the head of the nation. So Isaiah was saying that, okay, the Assyrians, they were going to conquer, but they weren't going to capture Jerusalem. Now, we're going to go upstairs to find out how which Assyrian king tried to capture Jerusalem, but the prophecy was against him. So you'd like to follow me upstairs and we're going to find out which Assyrian king tried to capture Jerusalem. Remember we said Tiglath and Leza. Captured all, all that territory. After Tiglath and Leza was Shalmaneser. Shalmaneser? Shalmaneser. After Shalmaneser was Sargon. It's mentioned in the Bible, Isaiah 20, verse 1. Between Shalmaneser and Sargon, in 740 BC, they besieged Samaria, which is the capital of the ten tribe kingdom. They brought an end to the 257 year independent rule of the Ten Tribe Kingdom. So in 740 BC, there was no more Ten Tribe Kingdom. Yeah? 740 BC. All was left was what? A Two Tribe Kingdom. Jerusalem. The new king, Assyrian king, is Sennacherib. Sennacherib? Mm -hmm. He won. How do you say that? Sennacherib. He wanted to capture Jerusalem. He wanted Jerusalem as his trophy. But he was engaged in, he had a confrontation with the Egyptians further south of Jerusalem. So he sent a man, Reb Shekhar, a military Reb title, Reb uh -huh. He was sent to Jerusalem mm -hmm. to taunt the Jews into surrender. Now, who was the king in Jerusalem at this time? Sorry? Hezekiah, very good. So turn to the book of Hezekiah. There's only 66 books, but there isn't 67 books. Okay, so Isaiah prophesied. Should I? That Hezi because Hezekiah turned to Jehovah for help, because he was a good king, Isaiah prophesied that what they have to be Isaiah 37, the second prophecy. Oh, this Isaiah 37. We're going to look at verse 21, then verses 33 and 34. Isaiah 37, in the sentence, this is what the king of God is going to say. Because you have prayed to me, concerning Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. He will not come into this city. No one he shoots out of there, no one confronts him to the shield, no one else ever sees the empire against him. By the way, by the way, by which he came, he will return into this city. He will not come. That's quite definite. What we're saying, he will not. Snapper wouldn't even step foot in the city. Wouldn't even mount an attack against the city. Do we have any evidence? Well, interestingly, one historian said Snapper had lost his army to some mysterious plague. Do you know what happened to his army? Hundred and eighty-five thousand in one night. The inside volumes tell us that angel was Jesus Christ. 
Now, do we have evidence that he failed to capture the mountain attack? Well, we have Sennacherib's prison. Have you heard of Sennacherib's prison? This hexagonal prison was the last of the records of the animals of the Sennacherib before he died. He was assassinated by his sons. But on here, did all he record it? He recorded what took place. This is the original. Everything on the tour is original. Even the guy. <laughs> <laughs> I see that your your prison. <laughs> Very good. Taylor's prison. It's called. You see. <laughs> they also call it. No, that's what they call it. Taylor's prison as well. But Snack is what we know it as Snacker's prison because Snacker is mentioned on it by name. But he said that he had Hezekiah, the Jew. Like a bird in a cage. A bird in a cage. <laughs> he had Hezekiah the Jew like a bird in a cage. But, interestingly, nowhere, nowhere on the prism does it say that he attacked Jerusalem. It doesn't even say he, sh he shot an arrow there. Nowhere on the prism. But do you think that if if they had attacked Jerusalem, do you think it would have been mentioned on here? Of course. It would. In fact, I think we would probably be walking around a gallery <laughs> with all the scenes. <laughs> we would, wouldn't we? You can search on here, nowhere does it say that he attacked Jerusalem. Why? Because Jehovah is a God of true prophecy. If he says it in the Bible, well, you better believe it. It's going to take place. And that's what happened. He was later assassinated by his sons, and that was the end of Sennacherib. <laughs> Wasn't him said as well that, uh, that no God had, uh, no other nation's God yes. had left, how yes. do you say? Yes. No other nation's God was able to deliver them up. <laughs> Yes. Why Jehovah would deliver them up? Who is Jehovah? So Jehovah to the left, isn't it? So Jehovah showed his strength to the angel. Very good. Good Bible students. <laughs> now, so we can see the flooding went as far as the name. That was the decline of the Assyrian Empire after that. So which world power succeeded? Assyria. Which will power is the next one? Babylon. Babylon. Now, would Isaiah prophesy about, prophesy about Babylon? Would he? Well, let's have a look. Isaiah 39. <laughs> Isaiah 39. 39. Now, if somebody were to say to you that Camden going to rule the world. <laughs> Not London, because I know you're in London, but Camden <laughs> is going to rule the world. Would you laugh? No! <laughs> Remember me when you get into your kingdom. <laughs> well, from our perspective, we do rule the world. You do? Okay. Very good. But this is what it would have sounded like, this prophecy when it was recorded. It says, Look, days are coming, and all that in your own house. What, what verse? Six. Verse six. Thank you. Look, days are coming, and all that is in your own house, and that your forefathers have stored up down to this day will actually be carried to Camden. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing will be left, Jehovah has said, and some of your own sons that will come forth from you to him will become father will themselves be taken and actually become good officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. So that's what it would have sounded like. People would have said, Babylon? How could Babylon ever rule the world? It's nothing. It's just like Camden. Nothing. <laughs> but true to the prophecy. In fact, what were they saying? They were saying that they would take them captive. They would accomplish what Assyria failed to do. Capture, capture Jerusalem. So they were saying Babylon was going to be even greater than Assyria. So we're going to find out 
more about the Babylonian king. But which king, Babylonian king, was responsible for Babylon becoming the next full power of Bible history? Nebuchadnezzar. Let's have a look to see the Babylonians come. As information about Nebuchadnezzar. And we can see what's recorded here on the plaque at the back is relation to what's on the tablet. Now, what was one of the features of Babylon that made it world famous? Please. Uh, it's very, very, very quite possibly uh, low, because it became uh, a truly a world power. It was stretched even further, didn't it? Very good. What was one of the features? Please. Very good. The hanging gardens. gardens. The hanging gardens of Babylon. Yes, the hanging gardens of Babylon. Because of the hanging gardens of Babylon, it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I think there's eight, isn't there? There's Camden Lock. Yeah. Yes. And then there's... <laughs> <laughs> one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So, I don't know if you've ever had hanging baskets in your home. Baskets with flowers? Yeah. You're very proud, aren't you? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Depends on whether they get watered. Well. Well. So imagine if you had the best hanging baskets in the world. People Ooh. travel from all over the world, Mesopotamia, to visit Babylon, to see the hanging gardens. So how would Nebuchadnezzar feel about them? Let's have a look. The second paragraph, relation to this, it says, I am Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the exalted prince, the favoured of the god Marduk, the beloved of the god Nebu, the arbiter, the possessor of wisdom, who reverences their lordship, the entire governor, who is continually anxious for the maintenance of the shrines of Babylon. So he was continually anxious to maintain this beautiful uh, empire, this city, always watering his flowers. <laughs> Let's have a look in Daniel chapter 4, which describes similarly how Nebuchadnezzar felt. And Daniel chapter 4, in verse 28, notice where he's mentioned by name here. He says, all this befell Nebuchadnezzar the king. Same Nebuchadnezzar mentioned there. At the end of 12 in the months, he happened to be walking upon the royal palace of Babylon. The king was answering and saying, is not this Babylon the great? That I myself have built for the royal house with the strength of my might and for the dignity of my majesty. Very good. What's your name again? Alexander. 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 Alexander the great magnum. Mm -hmm. Alexander says it's the same arrogance that's on this tablet. Isn't that amazing? So, did Daniel make up Nebuchadnezzar as a character? No. No, by far. It's the same character in the Bible. Look at Daniel. Daniel 4 again. Remember he had a dream. Nobody could interpret the dream. Do you remember? Now look at Daniel 4 and verse 7. Because he had advisors to advise him. These are the list of some of the advisors. At that time, as Daniel 4 and verse 7, at that time, the magic practicing priests, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers were entering. And I was saying before them what the dream was, but its interpretation they were not making known to me. So you notice the advisors of Nebuchadnezzar? What were they? Mention any of them? Please? It says conjurers and magic practice. Magic Very good. Sorry? Today we have common with astrology. So we can see the astrologers. Very good. Very good. Very good. They found this clay tablet just over here. It says this document Named 45 individuals were on hand to advise the king. There were seven astrologers, nine exorcists, five experts on liver omens, nine physicians, six chanters, three experts on foretelling the future through the movement of birds, three interpreters of dreams, and three Egyptians. Wow. Is that incredible? These are the advisors that the Babylonian kings had in their court. Is that list not similar to the one that we've just read in the Bible? Is that the um, same uh, person? No, that's another Babylonian. That's another Babylonian king. But it's helping us to appreciate that the kings 
had advisors similar to the list to what's recorded in Daniel. Isn't that remarkable? Sometimes, you know, you can read the Bible and you can think, well, that doesn't happen now. You know, it didn't really happen back then. But when we go back in history and we look at what has been found, we can see, no, it's an accurate picture. These events took place. These people existed. And this is what has happened. But it, it mentions there, experts at liver omens. What's one of those? Liver omens. Is it a chef? Okay. Let's go and find out in the gallery. Experts at liver omens. What they would do, they would take a sheep's liver and they would make holes in the sheep's liver. And they would, those holes would be lined with the constellations, the stars. So what, when they look into the liver, what would it basically be? Astrology. 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 Looking into the liver. They would map the stars out on the liver. Yes. And they found, in a school in Babylon, a clay model of a sheep's liver. Can you find it in here? Where is it? Just in the corner. You can see it. You see yes. the holes? That's the constellation. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Just in the corner there. But all it was was astrology. Uh, what's your star sign? Have you ever been asked that? Have you ever been asked what your star sign is? Yeah. You can see, can't you? you the, the origin of these things. Now, in Ezekiel 21 and verse 21, we can see the Babylonian king, Ezekiel 21 and verse 21, deciding whether to march against Jerusalem. It says, For the king of Babylon stood still at the crossways at the head of the two ways in order to resort to divination. He has shaken the arrows, he has asked by means of the teraphim, he has looked into the liver. This was the king deciding whether, Nebuchadnezzar deciding whether to march on Jerusalem. Consulted the astrologers, yeah. the demons. Although Jehovah allowed it to take place, you see, he consulted, as he normally did, the astrologers. Yeah. Jehovah stood back and let it take place because the Israelites were so bad. And it was foretold that they would be captured. Now, you know Ronald Reagan turned to astrologers once, didn't he? Ronald Reagan. And it was, it has been said that Hitler used astrologers and the Allies turned to astrologers to find out what the astrologers were telling Hitler. <laughs> really? That's Who was controlling these things then? Why is our world such a mess? Can I say it? You can. The God of this system of things. Very good. Yeah. Very good. The God of this system of things. You can see who's behind all the troubles. Now, you mentioned about Babylon. So we've come to Babylon. Now let's go to the time of the fall of Babylon. Which Babylonian king was in Babylon when Babylon fell? Belshazzar. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but, but, but he wasn't there. Let's find out. Sure. He wasn't there. Let's he's, find he's, out. He's, he's, You've been reading the Bible too much. It's your problem. <laughs> okay. Now we come to the time of the fall of Babylon. But first of all, I want to ask you another question. I've been asking you lots of questions. You've been doing very well. What year did Babylon fall? Five thirty-nine. Five thirty-seven. No doubt. Very good. <laughs> Five thirty-nine BC. When did we start our tour? Seven hundred and eighty. No. Seven seventy-five. Seven seventy-five. Seven seventy-eight. So how much time has passed by, roughly, since we started our tour? Two hundred. Over two hundred years, and you don't look a day older. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't very much. Now, over 200 years has passed by, and we're now at the time of the fall of Babylon. And so, historians say, look, Nabonidus, you see Nabonidus here? Nabonidus. He was the king in Babylon in 539 BCE when Babylon fell. We have this stella here of Babylon. Stella is just a boundary marker which says you've just arrived at Babylon. And we have a sign outside maybe. And you see Nabonidus roots worshipping his trinity of gods. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
You notice Trinity? Nothing's changed. So they say they're Nabonidus. But what does, who does the Bible say was the king in Babylon when Babylon fell? Belshazzar. Belshazzar. So they said, oh no, we can't accept that. We have no evidence of Belshazzar. That has just been made up, you see. If you have a look at the account, <laughs> have a look at the account in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel 5 verse 1, it says, as regards who? Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, the king, he made a big feast for a thousand of his grandees and in front of the thousand he was drinking wine. Belshazzar, under the influence of the wine, said to bring in the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken away from the temple that was in Jerusalem. That from them the king and his grandees and his concubines and his secondary wives might drink. So, it looks as though he was having a bit of a party. Thousands there. But do you remember what appeared on the wall? His hand. Don't worry, it was harmless. You only get that if you're English. His handwriting. Do you remember what he said? What did he say? Mini, mini, tickle, parsi. And what happened? Somebody mentioned about his knees. What happened to Belshazzar's knees? They started knocking. You have been weighed. Isn't it? Very Same. good. You found, one. You found, you found uh, the deficient. Very good. You sure English isn't your first language? No. <laughs> very excellent. You're very good talk. Yes. <laughs> so his knees were knocking, handwriting on the wall. Nobody could interpret the handwriting except Al Handro. <laughs> now, they called Daniel in. <laughs> they called Daniel in. And do you know what he was offered? if he could interpret the handwriting. Look at chapter verse 16. He said, I myself have heard concerning you, that is Daniel, that you're able to furnish interpretations and, and tie knots themselves. Now if you're able to read the writing on the wall, 16. verse 16, yes, and make known to me its very interpretation, with purple you will be clothed, a necklace of gold around your neck, and the third one in the kingdom you will rule. That sounds odd. Why did he not say to him, uh, I'll make you second in command? Because that guy was the first one, and Nebuchadnezzar, uh, this guy, Belshazzar, was the second one. He was the co regent. And what evidence do you have of that? Biblical <laughs> <laughs> evidence. What are you going to say? It's, uh, in the inside book, it actually says they found um, documentation like this to say that he was the son of Vassal King. Are you sure? There's something sound. Wow. Something I think sound. you're on the right tracks because about a hundred years ago, this is what they found just oh. over here. Can you see this? Terracotta cylinder. Very good, very good. See the large cylinder there of the two. Can you see this cylinder here? It says this terracotta cylinder describing work on the temple of the moon god seen at Ur by Nabonidus and including a prayer for the king himself and his son who? Belshazzar. 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 So you can imagine they're digging in the dirt, they find this cylinder, oh. blow off the dust, they get the experts to read it, Belshazzar, well, that, that name is familiar, they get all the books and then they remember, it's in the Bible, that's where we know it from. So do you know what they did? They apologized. <laughs> the Bible was even more accurate because Daniel, when he recorded it, he didn't mention Nabonidus because he mentioned the third ruler. He was recognizing that there was a co regent, a co rulership. Nabonidus and Belshazzar ruled together. Father and son ruled together. In fact, Nabonidus was away from Babylon when he was captured. Babylon was captured. Belshazzar was killed. Nabonidus was later taken captive. Isn't that amazing? Now, what year did Babylon fall? 537. What month? Uh, August, October. What did you say? August, October. August, October. That's quite a distance. Yeah, that's quite a distance. Very good, October. What day? It's a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday. Fifth of October. And that is what we call a 
Pivotal date. Very good, a pivotal date. A pivotal date is a date where archaeologists, historians and the, and the Bible agree that an event took place. So you can pinpoint that date, you can calculate other events, can you? Like yeah. the flood, creation of Adam, even 1914, all from October the 5th, 539 BC. How many pivotal dates are there? How many seem to know the answer to this question? How many pivotal dates are there? I don't know. Have a guess. The robot knows everything right now. Very good answer. How many? One. Is that it? There's two. Two. What was the second one? 29 C. Jesus Christ. 539. When you realize there's only two people dates, that can change your study of chronology. There's two dates. There's only two dates that we work out all the other dates from. Isn't that amazing? So they're important. But what is the archaeological and historical evidence that Babylon fell October the 5th, 539 BCE? The Nabonidus Chronicle. Have you heard of that before? Mm -hmm. How big do you think it is? Sorry. You think it's tiny? Mm -hmm. You think you fit it in your, in your purse? Have you got a purse, have you, brother? <laughs> 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 well, the guards are watching, so be careful. <laughs> Do you think you fit it in the suitcase? Handbag? You're not, not taking any chances, are you? Well, let's have a look over here. Second from the end. No. Look at that. Yeah, you could fit it in your purse, brother. <laughs> well done. Can you see that? That is the most detailed account of the fall of Babylon. But in fact, the information on the Nabonidus Chronicle was put together by Cyrus. So that gives us a pivotal date, 539 BCE. Isn't that amazing? So, but we didn't mention which war power captured Babylon, did we? Should we have a look in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 17? It says, Here I am arousing against them the Medes. So Isaiah is prophesying way into the future about the Medes. And in verse 19 he says, And Babylon, the decoration of the king, the beauty of the pride of the Chaldeans must become as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's going to he's saying that the Medes, along with the Persians, Persia didn't exist at the time, it was Elam. So he's saying that they would overthrow Babylon. Way before that Babylon even became a world power. Incredible. So let's go into our final diary and have a final prophecy. Very good, so we've now come to the time of the fall of Babylon. And uh, Isaiah prophesied that Babylon would fall, but how could anybody capture Babylon? Because Babylon was an impregnable city. It had a three-tiered defense system. There was an outer wall, and there was an inner wall, and in between those walls was the river Euphrates and the canals. So there was wall, water, and then wall. How could you capture Babylon? The walls were so thick, that four chariots could pass side by side along the top of the walls of the city. They used to race chariots around the walls of the city. That's right. It would be like a freeway. <laughs> that was the fun part. <laughs> so, they had insurance that they were okay. <laughs> so, it was impossible to, to, to capture the city. And the only way into the city was the main road that led across those walls and on the inner wall, there was these huge copper gates that were always locked, unless there was a party going on inside. <laughs> <laughs> now, the Persian ruler by the name of Cyrus had a plan. He diverted the river Euphrates <laughs> into an artificial lake. And so the river, the, the water level of the river would have dropped. So he, in the night, marched his army down the riverbed. And so they would have marched under the, the bridge of the outer wall, wouldn't they? So all they would have to do then was to go up the steps of the inner wall and try and get in through those copper gates that were always locked. Now let's see in the Bible how Isaiah prophesied 200 years before how Cyrus would capture the city. It's Isaiah chapter 44. 
and it also mentions him by name. But we'll have a look at verse 27 first. He says, The one saying to the watery deep, Be evaporated, and all your rivers I shall dry up. So can you see how what Cyrus did that night was foretold 200 years in advance? That's why he was able to do that. What about the copper gates? Look at chapter 45 and verse 1, where Cyrus is mentioned by name. This is what Jehovah has said to his anointed one to Cyrus, whose right hand I have taken hold of, to subdue before him nations, so that I may ungird even the hips of kings, to open before him the two leaf doors, so that even the gates will not be shut. So Isaiah is saying that the gates <coughs> will be left open. What happened? The gates were left open. Why? Because they were having a party. <laughs> so he marched into Babylon, captured Babylon, all in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Why? Because Jehovah is a God of true prophecy. But what was the reason that Jehovah prophesied this? What was the policy of the Babylonians regarding their captives? Please. They never released their captives. They never released their captives. So how could they go back and rebuild Jerusalem if they were trapped in <coughs> Babylon? They would have to have a change of policy. Now, look at chapter 44 and verse 28. Jehovah said, The one saying of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and all that I delight in he will completely carry out. Even my saying of Jerusalem, She will be rebuilt. And at the temple, you will have your foundation laid. Did that take place? Well, have you heard of the Cyrus Cylinder? <coughs> Can you see the Cyrus Cylinder just there? Can you see the Cyrus Cylinder? On the Cyrus Cylinder is Cyrus's policy of restoring people back to their homeland. And the British Museum says, this description of the restoration of local cults in Mesopotamia mirrors the biblical account of the restoration of the temple of Jerusalem. So the British Museum is saying that what is on here mirrors what we read in the Bible. Why? Because Jehovah is a God of true prophecy. How about that? So we have seen the fulfillment of five Bible prophecies running through three world powers, Assyria, Babylon and Medo-Persia, covering hundreds of years. But did Isaiah stop there? No. He prophesied about the way into our future. What did he say? The eyes of the blind will be... We'll have 2020 vision. No more spectacles. Or no more contact lenses. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame one will climb the stairs of the British Museum like a stag. <laughs> no resident will say, I am sick. Death will be no more. So we look forward to that, don't we? Or from Isaiah. We'll build houses and have occupancy. We will play with wild animals and not be harmed. All these things from the book of Isaiah. Do you believe they will be fulfilled? That's the question. Yes. Are you convinced Absolutely. that Jehovah is a God of true prophecy? Now I'm going to ask you a question now about Cam Camden. I know you're experts. <laughs> Has anybody ever seen the rain fall and stop above your head? No. In Camden. <laughs> Because we have medical help available if you claim that you have. <laughs> now notice what Isaiah is saying about you if you don't believe that Jehovah is a God of true prophecy. In Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55 and verse 10, he says, For just as the pouring rain descends and the snow from the heavens and does not return to that place, unless it actually saturates the earth and makes it produce and sprout and seed is actually given to the sower and bread to the eater. So my word that goes forth from my mouth will prove to be it will not to return to me 
without results. But it will certainly do that in which I have delighted, and it will have certain success, and that for which I have sent it. So Jehovah is saying, just as it's impossible for the rain to fall and not to hit the ground, that's how impossible it is for any prophecies recorded in here not to be fulfilled. And you'd need medical help. <laughs> you don't believe it. So you all look as your eyes are all sparkling today with conviction that Jehovah's a God of true prophecy. Now what, what I want you to do is to go back into the field in Camden and take that sparkle with you <laughs> and I want you to pass it on to all the people that you meet. Just share with them a prophecy from Isaiah and then maybe when they look in your eyes to see if you really believe it. <laughs> they, might, you might, they might be with you next time you come to the museum to find out where you got it from. <laughs> so thank you for coming to the museum. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.